from a from a theology standpoint, I think the challenge we we face is there's the writing and the text that's out there that these systems learn from. There's both a combination of really good theology, very solid exegesis, and very poor theology. And a system like ChatGPT doesn't have an opinion about what is right or wrong. And so it's going to learn from all of these and maybe even in a very slight sense, begin to include those ideas in sermon preparation, which is not what you want, but may come in in a nuanced way. And so we just, we, we have to know where these, where our information comes from. Welcome to this episode with Anabaptist Perspectives, joined by Ben Harris um, to explore questions around AI and studying. Um, ben, would you want to just, yeah, very give us a brief introduction to yourself before we jump in? Sure. Good morning, Marlon. Good to be with you. Uh, so my name is Ben Harris. I'm a professor at Sattler College up in Boston, Massachusetts. I run the business program up here, but my background goes through the world of engineering and artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, so I've spent uh, at least more than a decade in the tech sector uh, before jumping into academia. So now I'm a teacher full time, but uh, I, I do my best to keep fingers in the, the technical world, things that are developing, especially with AI turning out the way it is. Yeah. And we may get a chance to talk about some of the technical stuff, but we're actually focusing a little more on the teacher side or study side of things for this episode. So we to jump into this issue with you know, thinking about AI and studying, uh, imagine a scenario, I think I heard you bring it up in another podcast, but you've got, go to church Sunday morning, preacher seems to have a smooth sermon, points are good, you know, he's got some ba cultural background, he can even talk about a few original language words, and then you'll learn, oh, turns out all the key points came from asking Copilot or chat GPT or somebody like that um, to generate an outline. What's wrong with this scenario? Or why does something feel off in a scenario like that? So in a, in a statement or two, I'd, I'd say it's because we have gaps in our understanding of where that information comes from, right? We have to think about how these these tools, as new as they are, how they're, how they're built, how they learn effectively, how they're, what they're trained on. Uh, I was listening to a, just a podcast the other day at, in tech world and uh, the podcast host noticed his reputation in the world of uh, artificial intelligence was not very good. And so he set out to repair it and it was able to, within a day or two, change how uh, systems like ChatGPT or others thought of him. Um, I said, oh, that's good for him. But if our, <laughs> if our hope in something like sermon preparation or study um, relies on, on precision exegesis and illumination of the scriptures, uh, and we're missing we're missing the layers in which we're getting our information to present to a congregation that I think that's where we start to feel, I'm not so sure about this because it, um, we don't get to see all the intermediate steps. We don't know how chat GPT develops, uh, it's, it's outputs. You can get wildly different outputs with very slight changes in, in the prompts or the questions that you ask. And so, uh, there's a, I don't want to over, I don't want to use the term black box glibly, but it, um, there's definitely black box behavior going on here. So it leads to, just lead, should lead us to questions, to curiosity. You don't know what's going on inside the black box, where it's coming from. So how do you right. change his reputation? Just update his own website and put new language on there about himself that it's funny, that's GPT exactly picked what he up did. or what? You, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly what he did. He went in the background of his website and um, he had spoken with some AI researchers and said, how can I improve this? And they gave him these little blips of code that he inserted into the back of his website that the, the engines would then pick up on and change his perspective. Um, from, a, from a theology standpoint, I think the challenge we, we face is there's the writing and the text that's out there that these systems learn from. There's both a combination of really good theology, very solid exegesis, and very poor theology. And a system like ChatGPT doesn't have an opinion about what is right or wrong. And so it's going to learn from all of these um, and, and maybe even in a very slight sense, begin to include those ideas in sermon preparation, which is not what you want, but may come in in a nuanced way. And so we just, we, we have to know where these, where our information comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that reminds me of some of the stuff I was playing with, just, you know, asking one of these engines about 
uh, another organization um, where I work and it just, it picked up, you know, the stuff we had on our website, stuff on our statement, fed it back to us. And there wasn't a lot of other information out there they could pick up um, as a search engine. And then, you know, that organization is connected to, to Christian missions. And so I start just asking it questions and so on. And yeah, it starts picking up the stuff that, you know, kind of the missiology circles that we might be familiar with starts picking up that lingo and spitting it back, even though it doesn't have, <laughs> obviously it doesn't have any of those um, convictions. Uh, it just brings us to another, another, I guess, limitation of all this is that, you know, any, any of these systems are, are limited by what we're calling the indexed web. Uh, essentially anything a search engine can access. So it has to be indexed for Google, but Google can at any time de-index something. So something won't show up mm. in its search results. And they do that all the time. They do it with offensive or hate or violent speech. They, uh, they don't want it to show up in their search results. So, you know, any company is able to do this. Anything that is an arbiter of web traffic can exclude things. And then those things will no longer show up in an LLM's learning uh, archetype. It just won't learn anything from it. So, it, you know, it's not that we treat these LLMs as compendiums of truth, and they are far from it, right? They, they can only get what they find. So given that, and just to push into the sermon thing a little bit, is there a proper place for using one of these large language models in that context, sermon or devotional at church or anything like that? Say there is there, uh, we. Uh, I'm comfortable using it for really what it's good for, right? If so, these LLMs take a huge amount of text, and they they're trained to develop writing styles that are effective and clear and succinct. And so, you know, if if I've sort of transcribed a good bit of a sermon down, and I'd like Chat GPT to help me like clean it up a bit, ask any ask any questions of me about the sermon, it can Chat GPT can play the role of a congregant who might have questions uh, and that's the and but then it's my responsibility to ensure that the the sermon and the and the information that gets preached is still accurate so i've not asked chat gpt to have a theological opinion or a view i've asked it to simulate and test me as a as a teacher and i think that's a good hmm. a good use of it that doesn't that doesn't ring foul of using something inappropriately it's your way of putting it in its place as a tool um which was my final question, we will move on from sermons to lots of other areas of life here in a bit. But, sure. um, you know, I remember, especially when I was young, somebody would have a, a devotional or something. It'd be a topic and they'd say this this topic or this word is talked about, you know, this place. And they'd list through five places in the scripture or 10 or whatever. And I remember... I don't know if I asked my dad how people get this or what, but very young, I just remember him saying, well, they used a concordance and that's how they found the list. Obviously, we got more powerful tools than the Strong's Concordance, which was a big paper book um, that somebody would pull out for prep. Um, but how different is this? Is it different in principle or is it just we're dealing with a more sophisticated tool or less sophisticated tool as it may be? I would say something like Strong's, and I'm, I have an affection for Strong's Concordance because I have, I have two of them on my shelf in my office at my home. And uh, but they, you know, from a from an LLM perspective, the the data that's contained in something like a concordance is just is one data point that gets added and trained into the model. So we use it as a you know our in our linear thinking processes, we use it to sort of trace a word through scripture and find meaning and nuance. An LLM will take it very differently, right? It'll, it'll in, in input that information. Um, and it, it won't, it, it can't, it doesn't know the intent of the reader, right? So an, L, an LLM doesn't, you know, if you're looking for the word faith throughout the scriptures, uh, an LLM can't, can't intuit exactly where you're going, the connections that the Holy Spirit's illuminating in you. It'll just give you a sort of a, I don't want to say word vomit, but it'll just, it'll, explode data in front of you without making connections because it's not smart enough, right? It, it, it is trained on what it knows uh, and it'll give you what it thinks is correct, but it's a probabilistic guess. That's the, the best these things can do is they, 
they take a they say what's the most likely correct answer and just give that and then it and then it moves on yeah i don't know word vomit doesn't sound like too bad of a term sometimes <laughs> i can resonate with that <laughs> depending what the examples are yeah okay i must think about more broadly you know this question of of study and how do we value study there so we talked about you know sermons or devotionals um, obviously, you're an educator. We'll get to a classroom context, um, but maybe first, just yeah, help us think about that more broadly. Going to work, family, um, being the congregant, listening to the sermon, whatever. Um, yeah, the realm of study. So I think that AI has really uh, th there's a temptation here in that our artificial intelligence systems way back in their genesis were constructed to simulate how the human brain actually works and functions what we know about the networks that that our minds are created of and the temptation i th i think i would i would phrase it this way is to outsource the responsibility to train and to think correctly right because when we're when we're studying when we go in and we do the difficult labor that's what study is it should be laborious if you're finding something challenging you're actually probably learning and that's a good thing. We should be comfortable with that. But what it's doing is it's tr it's training connections in your brain to more easily allow literal electricity to flow between synapses in the mind. And so that's a that is a physical analog to exactly what ChatGPT does. Right in the background of ChatGPT, the architecture has a a network construction, and it's training itself to to discern right from wrong, just like your brain would. So I think we would we would never want to educate or instruct our children to just outsource the responsibility to think correctly and clearly to something else. We'd never want to give that away. And but the temptation for us as adults is to say, well, you know, because the the study is difficult, right? I want to, I want to, I'll just have chat GPT do it. And it probably starts very small, right? It starts in little examples. Uh, but we I think our charge as Christians is to be on guard against doing this. Right, because one, it, you know, when our when our witness is called to the test in evangelism or another context, we may not have Chat GPT there to lean on as a crutch. Right, our our actual trained mind is now, you know, on on test, and how are we going to to do with what's in front of us? Yeah, no, I like how you highlighted that there. You know, for educating our fourth graders, and we don't teach them how to work through the math problems or how to understand things in mathematics. And we say, hey, just look up the answer. <laughs> okay, we know there's a problem there, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I hear you saying, well, for adults, it's more of a temptation to think we can skip the study because we got that in in fourth grade or we did that in high school or college or Bible school or whatever and kind of coast. Yeah, but I think as the years go by, we're, we're, our responsibility is to, you know, I think the church needs clear minds and for our entire lives, right? So, you know, as these things grow and become more and more accessible, boy, we, we, I, would, I would exhort all to not, don't give that away. That's a precious thing that the Lord's given you to train and to build in you. And don't put it in the hands of a company that doesn't have your best interest in mind, doesn't have the kingdom interest in mind. Right. I think that's a grave error that we would make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I and mean, I really like your point there about it just it's shaping us. You know, we're doing the doing the mental work on it. And if we get to understanding, it's actually shaping our mind, shaping our brain as well uh, in the development. So, yeah. How do you approach it in the classroom as I'm thinking about it? I mean, from a couple angles. One is everybody's worried about. You know, how do we test people now? How do we deal with cheating? How do we make sure they actually are doing the work with the material if the things we used to use, like a well-written paper, can be so easily faked or whatever? Um, that's one angle. Um, yeah, let's start there. Assessment or getting students to do the work or whatever. Well, the, the classroom is, is certainly that first line of uh, first line of combat that you run into with, you know, AI versus classical learning. And so I've heard a number of uh, 
approaches to this that, you know, and they start within, you know, we can't get away from the technology in the classroom that's coming. And so most colleges, including Sattler, where I teach, uses a learning management system or an LMS to do, to tr keep track of all sorts of assignments and grades. It's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And they, most of them purport to include an AI detection system. They'll, they'll say, we have a built-in uh, plagiarism detector that, you know, if an AI written something comes in, we'll flag it and we'll tell you. That is a, I think we've seen it over and over again in the statistics that that is kind of a, um, it's very much a cat and mouse kind of game because the, the, the system may catch a certain kind of AI written content, but the AI systems will then evolve to get around the, the hunters essentially. So then the hunters become a little more sophisticated than the systems do. And so it's this back and forth that frankly, I just, I don't want to get involved in with my students. <laughs> so you know, I, I don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want that to be the worry that the, uh, and so my, my encouragement to them is like one operate with integrity. I tell them on day one, if you like, here's what you can use AI for. Um, I'm sure you've all been exposed to it. You can use this. Uh, I said, but if you're, if there's a temptation to use it in a way that's outside of that, come talk to me, right? I would rather, my job here is to make you successful and to help. And so please engage with me. I'll help you get started so you can, you know, it's very much like accountability and discipleship within the congregation of a local church community. Like, don't, you know, just be open and, and frank with what's going on. My goal here is to help you. Uh, but within the classroom itself, I, I these days have pushed um, assignments that might have an AI inclusion temptation off to the side. I have a lot more students doing oral presentations, we've sort of gone back to the classic rhetoric. Hey, here's this here's this case we're studying, here's this conclusion. Have a conversation with me about it, right? Show me that you know what's going on. Uh, you know, we've gone back to pencil and paper examinations, right? Which, you know, teachers would love the efficiency of a digital exam that the system can grade for you, but it's also open to manipulation. And so, you know, if you're gonna take a statistics quiz with me, it's gonna be, it's gonna be pencil and paper. Uh, and that's that's fine. I will I will gladly shoulder the little bit of extra grading burden to know that this is this is really what you know, and then to help you along the way. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing you hearing you do two things. One is trying to build trust and integrity and know your students, and the other one is you know being savvy about it and removing some of those temptations and opportunities a little bit. So I've been out of the out of the university world for um, let's see seven years or so now. Yeah, I can't imagine how they deal with it in some of the classes. Classes I used to help with as a TA, you might have you know a couple hundred students in the class, and then got twenty five students assigned for each teaching assistant or something, and you know writing assignments uploaded through. Exactly that. One of those learning management systems. Um, yeah, with no relationship there in that volume. It feels like you're fighting a losing game, but so maybe if anything, it just calls us back to, you know, actually closer relationships in education and things like oral exams. I, I think you hit on one of the key points in that the, the, you have to imagine how sort of higher education has evolved over the years, that it's it's moved away from the, the small, I, I don't remember the, the Oxford model, I believe they called it, but the, the conference room table with an instructor and then conversation. And we've moved far from that, but that has been the, that has been the trajectory as the incentives for colleges have been to grow endowment and student population. And so they, you know, I have to imagine a hundred years ago, the idea of a 300 person classroom with a single instructor and a coterie of TAs to help would have been unthinkable to a, a elite university. Now it's commonplace. And so universities, you know, take advantage from a cost basis on the efficiency of doing it that way. They, you know, it's very efficient to get the information out there from one expert to 300 students and then have a, a team to support. But you, to your point, you lose the, sort of any relational knowledge between instructor and student, as well as how to, you know, individually tailor learning outcomes, right? It's just not reasonable to expect an instructor in that context to 
know every student, what's their different learning style, what are their career goals, how do you help them along that road? Now, I'm not suggesting that large universities are in and of themselves wrong, but I think we have to just honestly assess where where is the incentive for these institutions, right? They, how do they uh, consider themselves as doing better or worse? And so, you know, Sattler, where I teach, happens to be a small, fairly new institution. And so we have that we have that advantage of sitting in this small class space for now. Uh, but we're going to face the same pressures at some point. Is the pressure might be mm-hmm. like grow without bound, and do whatever it takes to do that. But my hope is that the this institution will resist it in favor of knowing the students, being able to help them contend with the realities of AI or any other, you know, whatever comes next 10 years from now, I I don't know where we'll be, but the, if, if human nature has remained the same and it has, there will be the new version (laughs) of, of something to watch out for. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I like that observation and the kind of forethought there that, yeah, you're going to have to, I guess being small gives you a chance to set a deliberate trajectory like okay how are we gonna how are we gonna handle this um yeah and and as you were talking about that it made me grateful for um not the university setting but you know some of the practices that i've been familiar with in a church setting where we've got small sunday schools that are discussion based or we've got in-home small groups or whatever you read a passage together sure somebody might pull up co-pilot on their phone and say, well, you know, here's the background or whatever, but hopefully there's enough people there who have studied, who can ask questions about, (laughs) about that. You're in there, you're face to face working on it. Um, And the other side of AI in the classroom, um, do you give them assignments that are specifically how to learn it? Or sometimes we just assume anybody can put something into chat GPT, but you know, I've also, I haven't done much myself, but seen various experts say, well, actually, the more you know about it, the more use you'll get out of chat GPT. If you're coming in there without any context, it's not going to help you that much. Um, are there things like that that you do to say, this is how you use it? Don't often do do that. I think the, I think the, that argument is a um, slippery slope argument oftentimes in that, you know, well, you, in order for it to be useful, you have to, you have to use it a ton, right? That's, mm. that's true for almost anything, right? To, to be, you know, the, the more adept you get at it, the more, you know, one, they'll say, oh, you're using it better. They don't acknowledge the dependence that is created. So like, well, you know, the more you use it, the more you're, the more you're going to be like the, the, um, the ease from which you get from point A to point B in an assignment or in a learning outcome it becomes becomes addictive like why oh, I, I don't know how i could do this any other way you know that's the i think that is what i really think we need to avoid is you know fight that argument that i uh, i chuckle because there was a it was about six months ago now this is when chat gpt was becoming was exploding in popularity and if you went on a job posting board there were people who would would style themselves they were prompt engineers not meaning they were on time, but they meaning that they <laughs> would they had learned to write chat GPT prompts. And they and they were they were saying that, you know, this is a real necessary skill. Um, now you don't see any of those postings, right? That has gone. And I think just because we've I don't think you want to jump we want to jump on this really rapid bandwagon of like getting good at this will be a a, a value, you know, become will become a profession. Uh, it won't. And I think we already saw that. And I, I think it just, yeah, it's, it's not, a, not an argument I want to um, push too hard. I, I don't, um, I think if a student asks, like, how can something like um, chat GPT, I actually had a conversation with a computer scientist last night. He was at our home for a Bible study. And I said, how, well, how about, like, are you using code generation? GPTs, right? There's there's these engines that can generate computer code to do all sorts of stuff, and he said, "Well, you know, we kind of do that, but the 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 message I have from my students oftentimes is like understand what the model is good for, right? If and if it's a morally neutral thing, right? Like I'd like to create a code to update my website a little bit, wonder, wonderful, right? It's 
what it's good for. And it saves you time and effort. But the to me, that is an effective use case of something like AI. But there's so many others that I think short circuit our ability to grow and to change. They kind of like we were talking about before, you lose the uh, the synapse development that you might have had if you had struggled. You know, I, I come from an engineering background and sometimes in programming, when you're working on a computer programming project, it doesn't work forever. And at some point your mind tells you, I don't think it's ever gonna work, right? You, you almost, you give up in despair until you realize that moment of like, oh, right there is where my error was. And now that I've fixed it, the whole thing works. It unravels and it's this very satisfying moment that if you don't, if you've not labored through, you'll, boy, you just, you miss so much opportunity. <laughs> yeah, even, so even in coding, even in the most computer, <laughs> computer intensive occupation there is, mm -hmm. got the dangers. Yeah, so I don't really mess with code, but that was one of my places using um, as Microsoft Copilot at work was actually spreadsheets and using some formulas that were a little bit beyond my range of competence. Um, it worked pretty good for that. But the same thing would apply like that wasn't the that would not be the way to to really get really good at using them. And, you know, I had developed spreadsheet skills the old fashioned way to to a certain extent. And so Copilot let me do a few things that were a little bit more advanced. Um, but again, exactly to your point, it didn't develop, you know, OK, now I have regex formulas in my spreadsheets. I still don't know how to write regex, <laughs> for example. <laughs> so. <laughs> Again, to zoom out, we've talked about this from a bunch of angles. Um, you know, engaging in deep study rather than just looking up the answers, um, it's something that you keep coming back to. Um, how would you articulate maybe the, the fundamental or basic value of study? Comes down to the, the, the both from the, from Deuteronomy, but also echoed in Jesus's words of what does it mean to love the Lord? with all your heart, soul, mind, and I'll highlight mind and strength. Mm -hmm. And so we we have this charge. And I think it it is for the Lord gave us minds and challenging questions and problems for our own good. Right. They're they're an actual good for us, right? The the scriptures in the sense, in a real theological sense, that it is the food for our souls. Right. We need a like when we study, when we meditate on the text and what God has said. There's a, you know, the truth of who he is and love for him is illuminated and grown. And, you know, we can, you can arrive at the same destination, right? Either, you know, when in, in study, you know, say you are, are doing an app or a, a Bible reading plan on your, an app on your phone, and you just decide to have it, you know, I'm going to have it read through in my car at 10x the speed, right? Which you can do. You can set up in the app to do that. Or... I'm going to, at, at cost, it might cost me sleep, I'm going to get up and open a paper Bible and, and work my way through each of the pages as I go. And there's a, there's a difference, there's a true difference there, right? If you, uh, I don't want to use a, and it doesn't, I don't mean it to be a silly analogy, but when you're, you're driving from Boston, where I live, to Portland, Maine, which is a beautiful city, right? You can take the highway there and it goes pretty straight. It gets you, you know, it doesn't take very long. It takes an hour and a half or so to get there. Um, if you take the back roads, though, you actually get to know what the state of Maine is like, right? You like, you know, on the highway, you miss all of those things. And so I think in with regard to deep study, you can get to the destination, but you you have missed the richness of what you could have, right? If, and I would I would ask the value question of like, you OK, so I got to the destination. You know, I didn't have the richness. That's fine. Uh, what is the cost versus value you've gained, right? You may have gained a little bit of time, a little bit of efficiency, but it, but ultimately you got the answer and it, it came up sort of empty, right? You, you've, you have shooed opportunities to learn, to grow, to be enriched for the sake of speed, right? And, and I think as Christians, we're, we're called to resist that, right? The goal is not just to, you know, get through our lives as quickly and efficiently and painlessly as possible. It's to, glorify the Lord who saved us, right? And so in, in doing that, we need to see him in his richness. And 
I, I, I have a hard time thinking that that comes in another way other than deep study and deep community and discipleship, right? Which cannot, that's not, oh, those are not things we can outsource. They, they, they are costly, but they are good. They grow our souls. We, um, I heard someone describe it recently that he was, he's a, this is a pastor who's a fan of deep study. And he, he said, I, I don't want to give deep study assignments in order to create people who have large minds and small souls. He's like, we actually want it to be both things large, right? We want large minds that are educated that gives us breadth of soul. We want to, you know, know and love Jesus as fully as we can in this life. And so uh, until we meet him face to face, right? That's our, so I guess that's one one charge for scriptural study, but also in, you know, take it into a, a workplace context, right? When you're trying to learn a skill or a trade. Again, I, I read another just a short article about um, a, a computer scientist at Google. So, you know, well-known company, but what made this individual contributor employee so special? He was a high, a high ranking individual was that he could look at a at a problem or not even it wasn't even a known problem but his intuition would tell him something that something wasn't optimal it would it could be faster it could be um, more, less memory intensive and intuitively he could dig down into the weeds and in about two hours do what it would take a team of lesser trained engineers weeks to complete right and that is not something that that ai can replicate Right. Most computer scientists are like, I don't want AI to code for me. Right. This is and they're not worried about their jobs. They just don't like how well it does it. And so what is it that creates this engineer's intuition to solve a problem so effectively or even in the carpentry or the in the contracting trades? There's there's cleverness and there's intuition and there's brilliance that is shown by some like, how did you think to solve it that way? Right. And it and it was not by taking shortcuts and learning. It was by observation and mistake and recovery and resilience and so that like if you want to if you want to be excellent at something you you can't take shortcuts you have to fail you have to learn you have to do the hard study uh, to be trained so your mind operates as a tool right i i think that is if i had to give a pitch for why the um, study is so important um and i won't even say you know i think deep study is a is certainly a valid term but um mm-hmm. I think we as Christians we over we we may overuse the may overuse the term depth. You know, what does it mean to be deep versus shallow? I think the the charge is to engage and learn in things that that actually are a challenge to you, that make your mind fatigued, right? That you're um, you know, you can't expect someone to to get up and run a marathon just by walking from the couch to the fridge every day, right? They have to go do things that are that are tiring. They have to they have to learn and be trained. And it's the same with our minds. We we have to do things that are hard. You know, you have to go. I love here at Sattler that they force all students to learn the original biblical languages. For many, that's hard. And for many in the American church, that's terribly intimidating. But like that's your your mind can be pushed in that way. It can be stretched, right? God gave us a written revelation that we're to interact with. And so, boy, it's... Um, sorry, you're going to get me going on this. I, <laughs> but I think doing yeah. the, the hard work of read and study like i think god god gave us that for a reason we're meant to pursue him in those ways Mm -hmm. yeah i hope you guys don't lose that original language emphasis that's yeah that's something that's important and worth worth fighting for and maintaining I was going to ask you with ask you for a concluding plug for the studious life and i think you've given us a pretty strong plug here um, I'm hearing words like, yeah, growth, doing the work, loving God by actually treating his word as food to be worked on, meditated on, digested, um, relationships. Yeah. Uh, thanks for articulating that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to close with? Well, you mentioned relationships too. And I, you know, I think one of our you know, as Christians, we have these relational calls, right? The Lord is a relational God. And so he's given us that, that call. One is in, I, I think in the context of discipleship, right? You're, you know, an older Christian mentoring and discipling a younger one. The, our, our, I think our effectiveness as disciplers or disciples even is determined how we've, 
I guess is a, is a function of how well we've we've studied, how we've been humble and willing to train our minds to do that, right? If someone, you know, if a, a disciple or a, say a mentee of mine came with a with a deep grievous sin or a trauma that had occurred. I think I would I would have been irresponsible if I hadn't put in the time and labor beforehand in order to wisely counsel that person, right? So I think the the shortcuts we you know we may if we avoid the the studious life, we're going to find ourselves in a place where we're out of our depth fairly quickly, right? Because the world around us is demanding like what is true of the Lord, what is true in His Word, how do I how do I apply this counsel to my life, and that takes wisdom to do, and that wisdom is only it, the uh, book of Proverbs tells us is like we we wait daily at his gates. We meditate on his, you know, we go over to Psalms in 119. We meditate on his law day and night, right? That's the, uh, it's not meant to be quick, but it is meant to be fruitful. And so we want to move in that way. And But also in our, so discipleship on the one hand, but evangelism on another to, you know, we live in a world that, you know, is increasingly looking at Christians as any number of epithets of, um, or in sort of insulting terms, and that's fine. Christ Himself was the the victim of much of that. But the, I think the the studious mind that that has put in the time to learn the truth of the word, how to respond to to arguments, to charges, to untruth, to that the gospel would come clearly in speech, right? Is something that is uh, is a slow grown tree if you want to think about it that way it's not a it's not an instantaneous thing you know i probably can't go to well i could go to chat gpt and say okay if, if this argument is made against me what do i say and it might give you some helpful tips but when the pressure's on are you going to be able to recall those instantly you know someone says like you know gives you a charge against scriptures I'm like hold on let me pull out my phone and, and punch it into the <laughs> llm for an answer here they'd say like what you don't you don't care enough about this to know and it we want to anticipate and avoid a charge like that that you know the lord is important to us enough that we love his word we we love the study um and i want to i guess the last comment i'll i'll give is that i the holy spirit is is so gracious in that you know maybe you you hear what i'm saying and you, and you think well i'm not a student i don't like studying i don't like reading i don't like um the the graciousness of the spirit in the word is such that like not we're not all gifted the same way. I'm a very studious person, but you don't have to be anything like me to experience the the growth of that studious life, right? Maybe um, I'm thinking with our own with our my home church community, challenging folks to like to busy yourself enough with study and reading so that you ha you have if you have these little like gaps of time during the day you you have to fill them with scripture in order to get done what you're trying to get done right like you're you're involved in this enough that it keeps bleeding into these little moments that you you thought you might have a spare time where you know previously you may have gone to tiktok or to instagram or some sort of diversion it's like but would we take those little moments and put scripture in there like what would what would the lord do with that right and you know i I don't know, but I'm led in I'm led in faith and from the scriptures that like he will bless and grow fruit from those things. So, you know, there there is no Christian who is outside of like God's promise to engage and to study and to love him with our minds. Right. We're we're all there. And he meets us where we are. You know, he's not gonna just because he mm -hmm. teaches me something and doesn't teach you the same thing at the same pace is kind of irrelevant, right? He's building his church in the way he wants to. So we can trust him in it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing us back to that um, fundamental reminder. I guess it's easy for us to, you know, we hear things about the importance of being in Scripture, being in the Word, and it's easy for it to uh, get old or slip past us or take it for granted. And I appreciate you just pushing in, hopefully helping to re-inspire us um, there. Um, so yeah, let's wrap that up for the episode. So yeah, to our, um, guests and viewers, um, listeners, uh, thanks for joining us for this episode, um, with Ben and you can check out things. You can find us on our YouTube, uh, podcast on our website, um, anabaptistperspectives.org. 
We also do essays in written form, uh, which you can find as Essays for King Jesus as a podcast, uh, or again, on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.